just let this load. I'll fill this simple thing out, and when I, get, when I hit create, I'll get almost this, right? This is a little bit custom, but I'll get this, basically, uh, which is a deployment of functions. So the middle one here, this is the function resource, this one, with a little lightning there. Um, and as you can see, it's a typed app service, which is kind of funny. And I'll tell you how that is. I'll tell you what this beast is later on in a demo. I'll sort of dig into under the covers here. But I wanna, what I wanted to do now is like everyone can just walk up to Azure and say new function app and you'll get this. And then what, right? Well, then what you will click on it typically and you will come into the UX for the function app. And in here, you can just choose whatever scenario it is that it, you, you want to choose and sort of click on things. The internet is there, but it's kind of slow. So you guys stop downloading those ISOs on the Wi-Fi right now. It's not even funny. Um, <laughs> the one thing you need when you're doing Azure Talks is like, I kind of need the internet. All right, so you would be able to just pick and choose a scenario, let's say data processing, and let's say the language would be C Sharp, for instance, and then you can say, I wanna create this function. So I already did that, and I just created the, the, the baseline thing, and I did a few tweaks to it because I couldn't just stand using the baseline one. So when I click on my function, I have here a C Sharp function. Um, this is just a function, just a few lines of code. It takes some input and it writes it to some output. Really, that's super simple. Um, you can see this is C-sharp code, basic stuff, and I can actually execute this. I can run this. Um, I can run it from in here. I can edit the function in here and do you know, more, more fun stuff. I can just um, do any edit that I want, I want in here. Um, and, and make some changes and hit save, and immediately my function is updated, right? So that's, I can just change my little function and that's it. So this input and output thing is interesting because it, it's something called triggers. And uh, you get those when you hit the integrate button and you can define what triggers you. And in this case, I have defined that there is a queue somewhere in Azure storage. Uh, when a message appears on that queue, I want my function to be called. So behind the scenes, some code is, is pinging the queue to check for a message. I'm not writing that code. I'm not responsible for that code at all. My code is just C sharp, just one method. And then I also output uh, to, in this case, to a blob. I write some output to a blob, and that's called a binding. I bind, in this case, to a blob. I can bind to, to multiple different things. I can go to another queue. I could go to table storage. I could do you know, lots of things. But uh, in this case, just super simple, get a message from the queue and put it in a blob, right? So um, that's all I do. And um, I'm not writing any code here which talks to Azure Storage. My code is not aware of Azure Storage, it's just a method. Uh, it really just takes a string input and has a, a string output. Um, so, so really, there has to be some kind of magic behind the scenes, because otherwise this would not work. And the magic you need to have behind the scenes is, is this file called function.json, where you will define your bindings and define, with, well, this is an input bind a trigger, um, it's, it's type Q trigger, and the output is a, is a blob type, so I'm, I'm outputting to a file. You, know, you can define these specifically in here, okay? So now all I need to do uh, to get the result is actually put a message on a queue, right? So let's go to, actually, I'll use um, Visual Studio for this, use the Cloud Explorer. And I'll go down to my vanilla functions deployment, and I have my storage account there. Let me see, should I zoom that? There we go. So I have my storage account there, the one which is connected to my function, the one that I have, have configured to use for my function. <clears throat> if I open that up, uh, you'll, you'll notice that there is actually, <laughs> I actually had a, a, an error before, and there's a poison message handling automatically, uh, which is good, but that's why there's a queue called vanilla poison, which is pretty strange. Anyway, the queue that I need, the, the queue called vanilla, uh, is not there. I need to actually create it. My function is there, is, is there and the, it's, it's compiled, and behind the scenes, uh, the, the implementation is still polling to see if there's a message on the queue, but it'll notice that there isn't a queue, and it'll just, okay, I'll, I'll wait around. So it's right there, it should be able to execute, but you know, it's not, nothing's really happening at this, this point. 
So if I create my queue vanilla, um, and, and we can see also in the output, the output will be here. Uh, there'll be a, um, an output here called, um, uh, I think that will be a blob container called vanilla as well, I think. But th th there's nothing here right now. So if I zoom out again um, and go and add a message to my queue, this is the, the Visual Studio interface for interacting with Azure Storage. So if I'll just say, hello, Copenhagen, something like that, and I'll put that message on the queue. It should actually be picked up pretty quickly. Um, in fact, this could be uh, sleeping right now because I haven't configured the polling frequency or anything. I, d I didn't do anything on this deployment. I just This is plain vanilla. And actually, if you don't use it for a while, it'll dial back and just go napping for a while. And uh, it should be working. So now it's picked up the message after a while. Um, it, it's, it's there. But now that there was a message, it's actually going to pull more frequently and then gradually just dial back if there are no messages to be processed. Because it, it'll go back and check again after finishing one just to see if there's another. Um, so anyway, now something happened. Let's go and see what happened. Well, um, in my blob containers here, I should be able to refresh that and see, yes, there is indeed a vanilla container now. And in my vanilla container, if I open that up, it has a file. It's called vanilla.txt. So if I go and say open on that file, uh, it downloads the file, and I will indeed have hello Copenhagen, right? So the message was pulled off a queue. It was processed, super simple. I was just logging the message and outputting it to a blob file. And, and there's the result. So that happened, you know? I didn't have to write any boilerplate code. I didn't have to host any application. I don't actually have an application. I have, what is it, three lines of code? That's what I have. That's my whole application. So that's what this thing is, um, or rather, that thing, right? It's a, a little bit of, of definition on the side, the magic dust, right, to make sure that it exists. It has to have a specification in JSON. And then there's my few lines of code. That's it. I think it's pretty powerful and kind of handy. Uh, I wanted to show you first, like, sort of just get a tour, get a feel for what that is. Let's do some more advanced topics. <laughs> um, now, let's see, yes, screen resolution, everything is okay. Let's talk about compute in the cloud, and I'll try to be as quick as possible, but it's interesting stuff. Uh, in, in the cloud, you have the cloud service. That was originally known as the hosted service. How, how many have deployed a cloud service? I know some people in this audience have, yeah. So you guys have been around for a while. You know this pattern, of course. It's the architecture, the original architecture for the cloud. Um, so in this picture, you will have your front end API, web application, something, and you would put messages on a queue to the back end. The back end, that's where compute kind of happened. You could do compute there as well, but I mean, if you had some background process that would run in the worker role in the background, right? So the problems with worker roles is that they're kind of slow to deploy, and, and you kind of degrade a server by giving it a menial, simple task. You're actually running most of that server time on thin air. Nothing's really happening. You're underutilizing still. Even though you're using the cloud, even though it's probably a good deal for you rather than hosting it yourself and maintaining it yourself, you're still underutilizing your resources. And, and you kind of have to understand some things in order to do this. But it really was cool because this was kind of the first true pass service. Just deploy your application package and off you go. You don't have to maintain a server. You don't have to upgrade anything or do anything at all. It's just there for you to run. So that's really cool, and, and, and it has some, had some really good features. I think this is funny, though, uh, that Microsoft felt that you know, platform services, that is the best. They said that back in 2010, and it's a pretty good statement to say back in 2010 when you don't actually have an IaaS offering, right? They only had a pass offering to begin with, so I'm, I would assume they would think this is good. But um, the market uh, you know, is what the market is, and, and they forced kind of Microsoft to add virtual machines because Amazon, right? Amazon are awesome with virtual machines, and the market kind of required it. Big reason for that is that the market wasn't ready to do platform services. Uh, later down the line, they added websites. So now you could simply host websites. They'd be much quicker to deploy and everything much more speedy and, and, and awesome. And probably most of you have used websites. Um, now, 
How about that compute again? Well, you still, if you, had, if you wanted to do compute, you still kind of need to run that in that worker role, even though you had websites. It's like, ah, come on. So all these people started running there. You know, I can do thread.q new worker item kind of thing in the background of my web application. You know, I can probably write a decent ha management system for that in like 150 lines of code, and I'll, it'll work. You know, if the, if the process dies, I'll reboot it, something like that. No problem there. So really, people kind of wanted to break out of this ceremony, um, out of underutilizing paying for a server 24-7 when you actually didn't need it all the time. So really, what we wanted to do was just run, like I showed you, a few lines of code. I don't want a whole server for that. You know, Just give me a, a way to run my code, please. So Microsoft did that. They created a project called Simple Batch, which is web, web jobs, originally called Microsoft Azure Websites Web Jobs. I know. It's a mouthful. Um, and then they renamed, they rebranded, because sites was kind of probably not cool enough, right? So it's all about the app. So they rebranded websites into web apps. And so now, of course, web jobs is called Microsoft Azure, Microsoft Azure Web Apps with web jobs. So that's kind of funky still. Uh, <coughs> web jobs is then a simple, low-maintenance, highly agile, low ceremony, and highly efficient way to run your business functions in the Azure platform. That's the elevator pitch. And, and so that gives you a way to just run a second process together with your web application. You have your web application front-end deployed, and then you have an additional process running in the background. One thing to note there, though, is if that background process is really hungry, it could actually starve your web deployment. But you know, at that point, you can just simply break them apart and have one web application deployment and have a separate deployment for your web jobs. That works as well. But it's a way to really, really simply and easily run something in the, in the background so that not everybody has to go and rewrite that boilerplate code to run a thread.q new worker item kind of thing. No, don't do that. Um, instead, just use web jobs. So time goes by, and Microsoft comes out with both support for containers in Azure Cloud and with this thing called the Service Fabric, which is pretty cool. I love them both. And you all know that, of course, that this is microservices. And microservices is kind of cool. So there, if, if you want to be really cool, you'll be doing two things right now. You'll be doing microservices and serverless, right? <laughs> yeah. If you do that, then you're awesome. So <laughs> really. Um, the thing about microservices, though, is kind of interesting. Microservices is not a technology. It's not a specific, exact definition. It's more like an architectural style, like a paradigm, if you will. Like, just kind of do microservices, and what's that about? Well, it's about a couple of things. Um, you have some logic and some state that you can independently version and deploy and scale just on its own and, and run that code. Um, it, it has a unique name so that you can talk to it. It has to have that, OK. And um, you can interact with other microservices and other code around you just as you normally do. VCF, I don't care what you talk. You know, it's fine. Um, now, if there is a failure, this thing will kind of stand up on its own again. It needs to be logically consistent, have high availability, have failover, and have these things. Because that's, that's kind of the features you want to get to when you're building something using a microservices paradigm. And then you'll host this inside of some kind of a container. OK. And probably just a small engineering team are building this thing. So this is my sort of run-of-the-mill standard definition of what a microservice is. Why am I talking to you about what a microservice is? Well, because if you do deploy a few lines of code in Azure Functions, that actually ticks off all the boxes, all of them. So a uh, deployment of your few lines of code to Azure Functions is a microservice. It really is. So there is not really much of a difference there. Microservices, again, is sort of a style. So by doing functions, you can actually do both of the cool names at the same time. Pretty awesome. All right, so finally, yes, finally we arrive at Azure Functions. That was added to the platform. And how is that different from web jobs? There's a, a, a specific difference, and it has to do with the actual word serverless. First used, uh, uh, the first trace of that is by a guy called Ken, Ken Fromm, who wrote that serverless compute. Um, 
word combo in, in some sort of paper that you can go and find. But then it became popular when Amazon was started talking about this. Uh, how many people have heard about AWS Lambda? Yeah, most of you. Um, Lambda is awesome. Lambda is really good. Uh, and then they have their API gateway and stuff, and, and they kind of pulled up the, the word serverless and made it meaningful uh, based on this. Uh, the big promise, of course, of serverless is that you will be paying only for what you use. That's the big promise. If your code is not executing, it's not costing you anything at all. When your code is executing, the you know, CPU minutes or whatever it is is, is the baseline for the, the consumption model uh, and the payments that you make. So all of the players, AWS came out with their Lambda, Google came out with their cloud functions, and IBM Bluemix even came along with an open source call, uh, project called OpenWhisk. So all of the players were in the field of serverless. All of the players? No. Where is Microsoft, right? They didn't have anything. So they, they had to like quickly scramble and build this thing called Azure Functions. And what Azure, Azure Functions is, is sort of the child of web jobs. It's the version two of web jobs. And the big difference, so literally Microsoft kind of had this already, but it wasn't serverless. Because when you deploy a web job, you actually have to deploy it to a web application host. And then if you want to have your, uh, for instance, the thing I showed you with a queue polling thing, if you want to have that running all the time, you want to make sure that your code is active and polling the queue continuously until there is some, you know, at some point there is a message. You have to actually flip on the little feature called always on. And if you flip on always on, you're paying for something all the time and you have an application deployed and that's not serverless, right? It's almost there, but it's not serverless. So kind of like Microsoft had web jobs, they had gone in the you know, simple batch direction a while ago, and I don't care who was first. Lambda, again, um, I said it before, I'll repeat, Lambda is awesome, right? Um, I mean, so is functions. Um, so, so literally, that's what Microsoft did. When you're doing serverless, you'll get to this reduced development cost. It'll be faster, it'll be quick. Um, and, and there's really no operational cost. You're just deploying some lines of code. There's nothing really to operationally maintain or take care of. You, there's a little bit of monitoring that you can do to see that everything is going okay. Um, that's, that's basically it. And really, um, if your code is called no times at all, it's not executing, it's not costing you anything, and nothing is, you know, you don't have to have any scale or anything. But when your code is called all the time, let's say that there's a, you know, a gazillion messages coming into your queue and you need to process all of these messages, then your code will automatically scale to handle that demand. That's the scaling optimized version there. And of course, at that point, hopefully you have a good business model on the back end there. Now you're paying for your function, but hopefully it's also making you some money. One more thing. This is green. I like green. Green is good. Don't forget about green when you're kind of pitching this to your like, boss or somebody or a customer. Seriously, guys, this is really green. And, and this is, uh, it's a very, very highly optimized way to run. There is no or very little, as little as possible waste with running this compute. And I like that. You know, it's a good, it's a good, um, a good motivation. So, um, function as a service, I don't know that it's a name or a thing yet. <laughs> FAS, I don't know. Um, I don't know that I care, but you know, you have IS, PaaS, SaaS, why, why not even, have, why, why not have FAS? But the point here is that you are not running a server, you're not maintaining a server, you are not even running or maintaining an application. You only have some lines of code. So, ta-da, right? All you need to do is deploy a few lines of code. That's what you wanted to do. So literally then functions is what? Well, it's the combination of your code and your events and data to get this nice logo and animation. I stole this slide from Microsoft. Um, so you'll get this beautiful thing, right? And it's generally, generally available. Functions is GA since November. Um, that was announced around the time Microsoft had their Connect conference in November. So it's GA supported product. Um, and there's tooling for Visual Studio. I'll show you this tooling in a bit, in a bit but it's still in preview. 
unfortunately. And it's for 2015 as well. So very soon Visual Studio 2017 will be out. And of course, they'll upgrade the, the, the tooling for 2017. Um, but I actually, <laughs> I actually only had the release candidate of, of Visual Studio 2017 on my machine. So before this presentation today, I had to go and install Visual Studio 2015. Um, but hey, uh, I wanted to show you the tooling. Um, there's other tooling on the way, and there'll be lots of more. There'll be a framework for you guys to build any connector, any trigger, or any binding that you want. You can build your own custom things to connect and bind. Like I just, I triggered off a, blo a queue, and I was binding to a blob. You can go and bind to Dropbox or you know where, where have you, right? So that's coming as well. So that's sort of on the roadmap. Um, if you want to look at this code, uh, you can. It's open source. So you can go and check it out, and it's right there in the repository. Everything that they execute to, to run uh, functions is right there in an open repo. You can do a pull request on it if you, if you want to fix something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, go ahead. Um, officially, they take pull requests. I don't know, that. I don't know if it's happened. I'm, I'm sure it has. Um, so basically, if you have one function, it's your code. There's probably some input, and there may be some output. Not every time there is an output, but there can be you know, some sort of result of what you're doing. Uh, then if you have many of these, you get a function app. And that's the thing that I showed you before, the function app. And um, uh, that's the, um, the thing that you provision in Azure. It's, it's, it's funny how it's, it's an app, right? It's, this is supposed to be serverless. Why did you have to go and say that it's an app? Again, that's the thing we didn't want. But then marketing, right? So we have the web app, we have the API app, we have the mobile app, we have the logic app. So therefore, we have the function altogether, app, right? So we have a function app. It sucks that they had to go and name that function app, but they did anyway. They didn't ask me. Um, so this is the, the unit of deployment to Azure. And you can put multiple functions inside of your app. Um, so what people have done, and actually this is from yesterday, <laughs> so if you go and, uh, and have a look at this blog post from yesterday, uh, I stole the image from there, um, and I can show you in the portal as well. What they've done is, is they have something in preview called proxies. Uh, for a while now, they have supported routing. So you, you were able to like, uh, assign a route on your function app. Uh, for your, your functions, because your functions can be, like I triggered off a queue, but your functions can also be HTTP invocable using, uh, you, you just like a webhook, you can call into them from, from the internet. And if you have many functions, you kind of want to decide the names of them on your, on your application, you want to give them a route. And now what you can do with this preview thing here is that you can proxy them onto a different domain so that you can like, have multiple function apps and multiple functions being kind of pulled together into one API. Yes? Of course. Of course, people are starting to build APIs with this. It's, it's code that you can call and, and make requests from somewhere, and uh, that's an API. Right? So, so in order to help this along and make it easier for you to sort of kind of break down whatever hierarchy of functions and function, function apps that make sense to you and still be able to combine them together into an API, and you can have a large API with many functions and many function apps and just the same thing, right? So now you can do that, and it's, it's in preview now, and I, I, I have not applied this to a, a working project yet. yet. It was yesterday. Uh, literally. Um, so, uh, but I think it's cool because it's kind of obvious if you have HTTP invocable code, uh, and and then you know pretty soon that turns into an API. So you can have all of your API hosted in functions, and sort of have defined routes like that. You know, they have slash API slash hello in this case, right? So you can have whatever you like. Yes. Is it possible to define this in ARM templates? I love that question. That's a fantastic question. That's in my deck later. I love, no, no, you don't have to shut up. Uh, I, I, love, I love, wow, ARM question. Brilliant. So just to be clear, in the last session slot today, I'm doing my second talk at this conference. It's about ARM. And if you don't know whatever, whatever he's talking about, you should definitely come to that session. And still, if you do know, you should come to that session anyway. It's a really good one. Um, the content is really good. You know, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the content. This is stuff you need to know. If you don't know, you should come to that session. Um, I've repeated it enough now, and I'm, I'm actually opposite Michel Bustamante. It's kind of 
it's bumming me out a little bit. And I know it's like Friday afternoon, so a lot of you folks will have gone home already, <laughs> but don't do it, because it, it'll be a good session. So um, let's see, next slide. Are you ready for it? Bam! Ain't that awesome? I didn't even pay him to do that, uh, <laughs> right? So yes, indeed. Let's first take a look at the resources that, that I provisioned, the vanilla deployment thing, and then I'll come back to explain to you what that. I'll, I'll, actually, I'll go and explain that, and I'll come back and we'll compare notes. So going back to, that's cool. I love how you did that. Brilliant, brilliant man. So we'll go back to Azure, and we'll go to this. So this now, if you haven't, if you've never been there, you should go there like immediately, or you know when you get home. Resources.azure.com. How many have seen this? Only a few. Yeah, most of you have not. There's like five hands going up. Cool. So most of you have not seen this. So on resources.azure.com, you can sort of drill down into all of your resources and see what you have, exactly what's deployed. And I'll actually share with you now because we have time to do that. I'm, I'm working pretty quickly here, so we have time. Um, I have a half hour more, so it's cool. Um, I'll show you the secret of Azure. You want to know the secret of Azure? You don't know it? Yeah, yeah, yeah? Got you riled up now. Um, so I'll open up my subscriptions here. These are all the subscriptions that I have access to right now. With this uh, user, I'm, I'm signed in, right? So I'm, 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 I'm authenticated as me here. Um, so I, this identity can, can see all these things. So I have my vanilla functions there, my, my resource group for the deployment that I showed you recent, er, earlier. If I open that up, I can go, sort of go down and I can see that there's a web deployment there and there's a website. Hmm. There it is, vanilla functions, okay? So I'm gonna zoom, zoom out and show you the full screen of this. So I can drill down, all the way down to my specific resource in Azure, right? So I'm now, I'm now drilled down to a resource, and this thing here is the template which creates that resource. This is the definition, the specification of that resource. And it's funny how that's a website, isn't it? So um, the type of resource is a Microsoft.web slash sites. So remember how they rebranded websites into web apps? Well, the resource underneath the cover is still called a site. So, you know, when, when marketing says web app, techies just go, yeah, I know, I know, a website. I got it. And, and, and it's even more funny when you go to, uh, you know that all the web, um, the web applications in Azure, they have to have associate, uh, be associated with a what? With, a, with a, an app. Do you, do you guys even know that name? App service plan? <laughs> That's a crap name, App Service Plan. Nobody remembers it. But yeah, there's that as well. So I can, I can go to my resources here, and I can find, where is that? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, it's web server farms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're laughing now. Yeah. You know where I'm going with this. So the thing that marketing calls an App Service Plan is underneath the covers a Microsoft.web slash server farms. So it is a server farm. So literally, uh, tech guys were like, yeah, so we have the ability to run server farms in Azure with our websites. And marketing was like, what? What do you mean farm? Really? No, we got to have a cooler name than that, you know, better sounding name. So it's all about the app. So it's web app and app service plan. And now tech guys go, what the eh? Huh? I don't even know what that is. But underneath the covers, guys, this is, uh, web app, websites running in, in server farms. But here's the, here's the secret of Azure, okay? I'm gonna show you to right now. So here's the management endpoint that we are communicating with right now, the management endpoint of Azure. Um, you'll see that it says WAC subscriptions, and this is the subscription that we're running on right now, the unique name for the subscription. It's not a secret or anything. All of them have a unique ID. And then WAC resource groups, and my resource group name is Vanilla Functions. That's the name of the resource group. You saw that before in the portal. And then we have providers. Uh, so it's uh, Microsoft.web slash server farms. That was the type, right? Uh, oh, there's one more thing I'm going to show you later. But the name of the thing is Vanilla Functions. Okay? It's actually Vanilla Functions Funk Farm. But that's the name of it. That's the unique name of this thing. So this whole thing here, this, this whole string here, what is this? What is this thing? 
Well, it is a URI, it's a unique identifier, globally unique identifier for my resource. No other resource in Azure has this unique identifier. Moreover, since this is the management endpoint, it's also a URL that I can talk to using REST. So I can do stuff with this. If we go back to the web application, uh, again, uh, I'll go back to my vanilla functions again, web site. So if I go back to my website, I can literally edit the template right here in the browser and make a change to my site. I could, I could do that. I'm not going to do it right now, but I could. What else could I do? Well, I could do uh, like actions on this endpoint. It's a URL. I can talk to that. It's a REST-based URL, and I can do stuff like start and stop. So if I do a post to this URL here, all the way down, the same URL, long, long, long URL, all the way down to my name of my site, it's vanilla functions func. Um, then I do a whack stop or a whack start. That uh, management endpoint will respond to that and stop and start and restart my site. So I can talk rest to the management endpoint uh, of this thing. So if we kind of zoom out of this again, just for effect, I'll actually zoom out. Um, so if we zoom out of this again and take a look at this, um, what do we have? Well, so all of the things, you know, all of the paths down to each resource, that's kind of like branches on a tree. And the resources hanging off the ends are leaves, right? Then if, if one subscription kind of becomes a tree with, which rooted in the subscription, if you have a bunch of, a bunch of uh, subscriptions like I have here, you have your little forest going, you all thought that, the, uh, that Azure was a cloud, right? Well, the secret is, the secret's out, it's not a cloud, it's actually a forest. Because all of us can understand what a tree is. And now that you know that they all have paths, all the resources, they're right there, it's kind of, now it's not so daunting and scary anymore, is it? Like I've seen a lot of people, like I see you guys going like, hmm, I actually haven't thought about that. That's interesting. All right. So um, I wanted to show you that, and let's also look at the other bit, um, which is the template, the ar actual ARM template. My ARM template for deploying this thing looks like this. Um, uh, it's actually a little bit redundant, and then there's a special thing at the end that I like. Um, I define um, four resources here. I could actually go with just two, but I do it a little bit more thoroughly to sort of give you a, a few more hints here. I have my website defined in my template, and that's, that's the definition of my, my application. And with, uh, and here's a legacy from, um, from um, web jobs. Uh, you, the, the data, the queue and the blob stuff that I had, that goes to a storage account. And also the log output that I was able to write log output, uh, that stuff goes to also to a storage account. If you provision functions in the portal, you will get one storage account and it will be the same for both your log output and your data output. But it defines actually two connection strings in code. One is called Azure Web Jobs Dashboard and Azure Web Jobs Storage. So here you can clearly see that the Azure Functions is a child of web jobs, because they, even, they didn't even bother to rename the, the connection string. So it's, it's actually still this, the old name. So you can see here that I can define not one, but two different ones, one for uh, the dashboard, one for the log data, and one for my work data, if I have you know, queues and blobs and stuff. So I can define two. But if you provision it from the Azure portal, you'll get one storage account with the same connection string to, to one storage account, which is why my template actually defines not one but two uh, storage accounts down here. So I have, um, there's the server farm. I have, I have my storage account uh, for my data, and then I have my storage account for my logs. So that, those are the two ones defined right there. So one more thing before we leave this place. Um, server farms. My server farm is uh, kind of special. <laughs> it's a special kind of server farm. Um, I want to show you, first, first of all, I want to show you up here. This is, this is, a, this is a little bit funny as well. Um, my, my web, my function app is hosted in a website. So the type is website. But it's not a normal web application website. It's a special kind. It's a function app kind. So 
since the word type was taken, they had to get another name. So they used, they had to go with the word kind. It's another kind of a web app, or sorry, website. So there's one kind of website for web app, there's another for logic app, uh, no, well, a mobile app, an API app, and then there's a, a, an additional kind of a website called a function app, okay? So that's how they had to like, roll with the, the ARM templates underneath the covers. And if you go down to this thing here, in order to make uh, this deployment serverless, it has to have a special billing model. It has to have this dynamic billing model. When the code executes, then you are billed. Uh, so it can't just be any old server farm that you can scale and do stuff with, which you can with your, you know, no your normal app service plans. So it's a special one. Um, it is a service server farm here with the kind function app, and then it has a, a special SKU called I1, and the tier is dynamic. So underneath the cover, there's this, this is like we're down way, like this is nuts and bolts now. I'm showing you exactly what's underneath the covers. This is like the equivalence of open, opening up the engine and kind of like diving in and, and rooting around, right? So that's what this is. So now you know how it runs. So let's, let's, let's you know, go all the way from the bottom all the way to the top. There is somewhere there's a VM in Azure. On that VM, I don't know if this is a big secret or anything, but on that VM, cloud services is running. Good old cloud service. Onto the cloud service, Microsoft have deployed what? Kudu, the engine which runs on the web apps. It's also an open source project. You can go and, and, and watch that. So they deploy the workload of Kudu onto a cloud service-based VM. And then on, into that, they deploy this special kind of a website called a function app with this special implementation. And into that host, you deploy your lines of code. The um, resulting scenario here is that you don't maintain the hosting layer. You don't maintain the app layer. You don't maintain the OS. You don't maintain anything. You don't handle anything at all. You just say function app, lines of code, do, right? So you don't have to do anything. Uh, that's, that's the beauty of it. But now you kind of know what's underneath the covers, OK? You didn't actually know that, did you? Or all of you, did you, all of you know that web apps are running on, on cloud services? They are. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's not a big secret or anything. But you didn't know. Ha. Um, OK, cool. So back to slides. And, and that's why I wanted to show that screenshot thing there. Uh, when you deploy that app service plan um, with your function app, you'll get this. And it'll have this green cloud, and it'll be like gray, uh, the symbol, the logo. That's the special dynamic type of, of app service plan. If you just go and create an, a normal app service plan, it's going to be you know, a dark gray with a blue cloud. Right? So that's, that's the difference between them. Now for tooling. Um, we're doing on time. We're doing great on time. Perfect. Tooling. So um, functions tooling is in preview. You can go and download it and install it. It'll look basically like this. It'll be the Microsoft Azure App Service Tools 2.9.6 functions preview for Visual Studio 2015. That's the thing. <sighs> right. That's the thing you'll be installing. Um, I've done that. It works pretty well. Um, it has a few known bugs, but not much. Um, then again, I'd like to say that maybe, like, for if you have an enterprise scenario, uh, you, you kind of want to have tooling which is not in preview. So if you kind of want to deploy functions to an enterprise big scenario right now, you can still do it, but you have to realize that the tooling is in preview. And uh, it also comes with these uh, CLI tools that you can actually download. I think it's like Chocolatey or something that downloads it. Uh, and install on your machine a little hosting environment so that you can F5 your functions on your local machine. Um, so let's actually, I'm going to start up a separate st uh, instance of Visual Studio uh, in the background here. Um, so if you want to run, there we go.
full screen. If you want to create your function app with the tooling, you can go and say, I want to create a new project. And you can go a function. And I have a folder for some throwaway samples. So I'll just say yes to that. That will create me a function app project uh, inside of Visual Studio. So with this tooling now, like before, we didn't have any tooling for it. And, and I would definitely not call that enterprise grade. But um, you know, we do have uh, some tooling now. And, and it's getting much better all the time. Let's see. I'm not showing my solution explorer. There we go. So you basically just get a, a little empty space like that with a host.json where you can configure some configuration settings um, for, that, for that. It's empty. And then some app settings. You can go and define your uh, connection strings if you want to work with uh, storage. And then you'll go and say, I'd like to add. And when you go add, you can't actually say add new item. It doesn't work in the preview, but you can go add new function. And then you'll get to choose which language you want um, for your function. And actually, that's on a, a separate slide that I have. Official supported languages right now um, are uh, C Sharp and JavaScript. But as you can see, they're working on quite a few more languages and scripting. So you can literally just take a, a piece of PowerShell, a few uh, lines of PowerShell, and throw them into an Azure function and have that execute on a schedule every morning at 7 o'clock, or I don't care, you know, a schedule. Just uh, run that you know, at any, any time that you like. Um, so there are lots of different supports there. I mean, F sharp is the obvious one. <laughs> this is a function, right? So kind of makes sense to have F sharp. And this is one place like um, Lambda is still awesome, but doesn't have all of this language support. I don't know that they will go there, uh, or they won't. I, I, I don't know, but Azure is ahead in that department, at least. Actually, I think that's on my next slide in the deck. But anyway, so I'm not going um, to stay in this demo here and sort of recreate the stuff that I've already done. Uh, we're going to go and talk about how to make this a little bit more sort of enterprise-y and more corporate. And um, that um, is in my slides. So why don't we go there? Uh, and oh, by the way, I could have done the F5 thing. Um, I'm not going to demo that if we have, I don't think we'll have time. But I can, yes, write a function in my function app. I can hit F5 and I can execute the function on my local machine. That's also in the preview tooling. That was not there before. So you kind of had to run them in the cloud. And, you know, we have Visual Studio. We're used to be doing F5 debugging. And also, yes, before anyone asks, I can also go and attach my debugger to a function running in Azure. So I can find the function in my Cloud Explorer. I can go to the function. I can right click on it. And uh, or I think it's the function app. I don't know. I, I don't remember. And you can right click on that and attach debugger. So you can debug remotely into the cloud with your local Visual Studio set session. So you can do all those things. You know. that's, I, th I think, honestly, I think that's what we expect uh, as, as developers using Visual Studio. We ex expect the tooling to be all there. Um, let's talk about. Um, continuous deployment. Let's make this a little bit more corporate. Because yes, I can right click on my function app in Visual Studio, and I can do publish, which will do a web de deploy of my files up to Azure. You know, that's, that's easy. Web deploy is, is standard. But of course, I can also do continuous integration. And yes, I happen to have a demo of that. Um, if I go up to Azure, I have my vanilla function set up here, I can, you see there's the proxies, by the way? It's right there, preview. Um, if I go to um, continuous integration, I can easily, from this side, pull in code from a repository. Um, and I'm not going to do it all the way here, because I already have that deployed in a separate demo. Uh, and I actually did it the other way around. I'll, I'll talk to that. In a, in a second. But yes, I can go in here and I can pull my um, code from like all of these sources. Um, you know, um, because of the Azure platform, this I would say is another place where Azure Functions is ahead of Lambda, where they have like all of this native integration to all kinds of crazy things because of the support of the platform. Um, so that's, that's, I think that's pretty cool. 
Uh, I like the logging features of, of, of lambdas, though. Um, they're better. Uh, but anyway, you can choose your source. And I've already set this up with Visual Studio Team Services. When you click on that, you can go down and pick, you know, um, uh, you can pick your project. I have a bunch of demo projects here, no secrets. So you go know, function demos, and I can choose my branch and stuff, and I can say set up continuous deployment. So whenever I push code to this repository, there will automatically be a deployment into this slot here, into this production uh, space. Okay. So instead of me doing that, I, uh, I was fooling around with a demo, and, and I was trying stuff out, and I was messing back and forth with things before, like this morning. And then when everything was working, I was like, oh, it's working. Don't touch it. And so the name of it, <laughs> it's, a, it's a funk demo CI test. But yeah, the name doesn't matter. Um, here's a separate deployment that I have. And this deployment is connected to my repository. So if I go and click on that, I get all of these. Functions. Um, so I get all of these functions uh, that I have in a sample library that I copied somewhere, uh, just so I can show all kinds of crazy things. Um, and and if I go into uh, Team Services, Visual Studio Team Services is the one that I use. You know, you can choose whatever you like, but I use that one. Um, <clears throat> and if I go into this, you see I messed with it a little bit there, so I had a, a few deployments that didn't work, uh, but, but now they're working. Um, simply what I'm doing from in here, I set it up from inside of Visual Studio Team Services. You can do the integration from the portal that I showed you, but you could also go in here and, and basically do this. Get the source code and do a deployment. That's it. Of course, I could do like unit testing and other stuff in here as well. But really, what we're talking about now is copy the source and put it on the machine. Because that's what we're doing. We're putting the source code files on there. When, when it's C Sharp that we're running, for instance, that runs in a .cs, .csx file, a C Sharp scripting file. So it is a C Sharp file with C Sharp syntax with C Sharp code, but it's not a program. It doesn't compile to an exe on my end. I'm just deploying it. The portal, or sorry, the, 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 the uh, function app in Azure is then, of course, taking my code and using the Rosling compiler to compile it and do some stuff on my behalf. But I'm not doing it, right? So li literally, that's my whole deployment scheme right there, two steps, get, put. <laughs> that's it. Um, so, so with this, I can, do, um, I can go to my other Visual Studio. Uh, this one, function demos, uh, where I have all of my code. Here's my function demos app. And all of these folders is one folder per function. So if you add a new fo function, you get a new folder. And, and if we like look at my hello world there, it's going to look exactly like my vanilla uh, that I showed you before. Uh, a folder called A01 Hello World, because that means that it's on the top of the list, so, I can, so you guys can see it. And then the two, there's a run.csx run and the function JSON. So I add a new folder here, and I give them, you know, I can copy this, copy paste, and give it a new name. And the name of the folder is the name of the function, and you know, simple like that. So if I make any kind of change here, and I push that code to my server, my, my source control repository, that's immediately going to trigger the deploy into production. So at this point, with tooling inside of Visual Studio, with continuous delivery onto whatever it is, right? I don't have to, like, it's hands-free deployment. Uh, I'm just pushing to my re repository. At that point, I think we kind of have enterprise. Like, we're there. Uh, and I think that's pretty cool. Uh, we're starting to run out of time, but I am nearing the end of my slides, so that's good. Um, I showed you language support already, so we'll skip over that. Just in case we had time, I actually can show you some more of that. Um, you can, I just want to mention, you can deploy functions as part of the app service without having this dynamic deployment model. 
So if your company is already invested in maybe using, for instance, the app service environment, like say your enterprise and you're using app service environment, you're already paying for a bunch of resources in Azure, a bunch of web apps. You're already running that stuff. You can just add your functions into that pool, which you're already paying for. At that point, it's not serverless because you're deploying to some service that you're allocating. But since you're already paying for them, that's fine. Uh, but you can also do the, the dynamic billing model if you want to. So you have the two options there, and I think that's pretty good. So in the dynamic deployment model, when nobody's calling your code, and your code is not running, then you're not paying anything at all. But if you're already paying for resources in Azure, just go ahead and co-deploy with that, uh, those resources that you already uh, have in your, um, in your uh, payment, right? You're already paying for that. So let me go to the cool Azure Functions demo, uh, the last one that I have. And uh, it's cool because it's kind of, well, I'm, I'm doing all the hip things now. I'm going, I'm going to show you this in use, using Visual Studio Code, and, and we're going to do, go and, and show you a bunch of features. So here's the, um, it's actually called several features. I, I think I kind of need to rename that um, and to, into the cool demo. But if I go and check my code here, it's a little bit more, uh, oh, sorry, I have to switch. Thank you. Um, so if I go to uh, my, mm, there. Um, here's, here's my code. Now it's, it's a lot more code and stuff. But um, as you can see here, this is a, an HTTP invocable uh, method. I can call that from the internet. And, and it's asynchronous, first of all, right? So it's async, it returns a task of HTTP response message, and the, the input is uh, an HTTP request message, right? So it's asynchronous, which means that I also have a cancellation token and all that stuff going. Uh, I am calling into this code here called hello.lib.greeter. I'm creating an instance of a class. Well, where is that code? Well, that code is in my referenced hello.lib.dll, so I can reference external code that I have written in here as well. Um, and that code is deployed in the bin folder, my DLL. I can copy that uh, file into my deployment and copy that DLL over to the server, and it'll be referenced into my little project when the code executes. Uh, another thing that I did, so I'm, I'm calling that code, I'm doing async here, so I'm doing you know, a wait in my code, so that's good. Uh, I can, um, I, what I wanted to do was, um, uh, my code was, I didn't want to output JSON, because, you know, JSON is kind of for the new kids on the block. We don't want to do stable, good old XML. So if we execute this method, um, you'll get XML, because that's really cool. So I, I went in and I did, uh, I, I used um, a NuGet package uh, called uh, something XML, and I do an XML conversion of my result here. I'm serializing an object into XML, and I'm outputting XML, not JSON, you know, because really. Um, what you can do if you want to reference NuGet packages, I'm just using XML.net there, um, is that you define your function dot, no, uh, your uh, project.json, and in project.json, you can put NuGet packages. And that will actually pull in the proper NuGet packages and compile them into the thing as well. So you can do that. Um, so <clears throat> I'm showing you now like a bunch of features of functions that you can do, which means that you can, you can literally you know, write anything here. You can reference from this to other functions in your library. You can have shared classes defined in other, other files here. You can have like maybe some domain objects like a person or something, a class. You can do that. You can write them in here as well. So all the things that you kind of need to do are here um, available to you. Um, but we, my friends, are now finally running, really running out of time. So I am going to start really wrapping up now and say, first of all, um, I'm going to ask you guys if you have any questions. Yes? What is the craziest thing you've seen people do with functions? The craziest thing I've seen people do with functions. What is the craziest thing? Um, Actually, most people that use functions are kind of, they have a head on their shoulder, they know what they're doing. So I haven't really seen very many crazy things, but if, you, if like, I'm, I'm gonna just 
inject, uh, you, should be, you, you should be doing asynchronous. And, and people are not treating their functions properly. They're doing dumb things with the things that they're calling into. And they shouldn't be doing that. They should be doing smart things, which is async and that sort of stuff. It's not a good answer. <laughs> so yes. Boundaries? Um, well, so I think uh, so. I think that when in, in terms of boundaries, I think that people are maybe not. They're getting lost in it. Like they're doing all kinds of functions, and all of a sudden, nobody knows what you know how it hangs together. So this is very decoupled. This is just a little bit of code there, a little bit of code there, and once you have like a whole forest of different little bits of code, it could become messy. So I've seen some people sort of entangle themselves. The point of functions, in my mind, is to keep it very, very simple and straightforward and focused. And if you lose focus, you can get into a mess. And that's you know a standard. It's, it's the same for any type of coding, really. You don't want to do that. There's one more question, and then we're out of time. How is it scaled? How is it scaled? Uh, it's, it's basically automatically scaled if you run the dynamic plan. Uh, you can um, tweak a little bit on that. Uh, I don't even remember how it's done at, at this point. See if I can, uh, I'm checking in the background. Um, uh, I don't know that I have a good answer on that one. Um, so, uh, hang on. Mm. There are a couple of settings I'm looking on. Um, right, so I'll, I'll just, show, uh, it's not a complete answer, uh, but um, typically um, it should be dynamically scaling to meet your needs, basically. Uh, just uh, if a lot of people are calling your code, then you should get more power. Um, but you can set a couple of, you can tweak a couple of settings in the host JSON file. And you can fiddle with some stuff there to see how many concurrent calls am I, am I allowing here so that I maybe uh, don't do too many. Maybe my underlying resources can't handle too much load. And I'll have to like queue up in my queues. Uh, and, and when work is, is slowing down, um, you know, it'll, it'll um, even out over time. But you can sort of uh, set constraints on it. Uh, there's a, a setting inside of the portal as well where you can... Um, uh, go to this and, and set at least a maximum amount of this is how much I'd like to spend in a, in a month. Uh, uh, like there, there's just a quota. Uh, I don't want to spend more than this, so you don't get runaway functions like a, somebody decides to call your function 46 million times and you're paying for it. <laughs> right? So maybe <laughs> that's not a good thing. So there are a couple of tweaks that you can do. But, but there's, um, yeah, I don't have a really, uh, you know, complete answer on the scaling thing. It does scale really well to high demands. Um, and, and if you are sniffing about on the top level there of really, really high demands of throughput, uh, you can run into some boundaries because it's not infinite. But I have yet to see that actually happen. Most people just scale. It just scales. And everyone's like, oh, this is awesome. It just runs. Um, so, basically. Um, so, to summarize and to end things, we're over time even. Um, I'm going to stop right now by saying, I think that we will kind of, we're going towards a place where we're not focusing on the CPU, RAM, hard drive, and that sort of stuff. We kind of expect that there is capacity for what we want to do, and we just pay for exactly what it is that we're using. Um, Functions is still kind of young, but it's very competent already, and it's getting better and better. So I think it's a very well worth thing to, to, to take a look at. Um, so but with those words, I want to thank you guys for uh, your attention today. I hope it was useful to you. Thank you for being here. <laughs>